Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks for those of you who came to my talk. I noticed that I'm the same time that Tim's over there talking about CUDA Native, and I wish I could be over there right now. So <laughs> glad you're here. Bear with me. Hopefully we'll make it interesting. Um, so let's kind of talk about what we're going to do. I'll give like a one minute intro to who I am, and then I want to talk about like uh, a collection of three related packages. Uh, the first is called Dolang. And what this is, is it is a library that specializes in manipulating symbolic expressions uh, and also compiling them to efficient Julia code. Then I've got dolo.jo, which is, it leverages Dolang as kind of a compiler and is used to solve rational expectations models. Um, and then Dino. .jl is a prototype of Dynair in, in Julia. I'm not going to talk much about it. I'll just mention uh, in passing maybe at the last 30 seconds or so. Uh, and just as a disclaimer today, I'm going to talk more about the tooling that I've been building, not so much about economics. But if you're interested in talking economics, talk to me later. Uh, we can chat. Um, so a little about myself. I'm four plus years into my PhD in economics at NYU Stern. I live in New York City with my wife, our three kids. We live on the Upper West Side. Uh, I'm a lead developer or core member of the Quant Econ team. And by that, I really mean I wrote the Julia libraries and got the Julia version of the lecture website kind of off the ground uh, a couple years ago. And I've had varying activity in the Julia community for the last three years. There's a handful of packages I've written with Quant Econ, Plotly.js. Um, I've also made contributions to a handful. And I helped Stefan and Jared Lander run the NYC, or the New York City Julia meetup group. Um, so I'm around. Kind of goes up and down depending on how busy I am with my research, but that's a little about me. So let's first jump into that first package I mentioned, Dolang. So what is it? And really, I describe it as a, a toolbox for working with mathematical objects in symbolic form. And it's really split into two main components. One is I've got a set of like underlying simple functions that manipulate these mathematical expressions. And we do things like substitute out a particular sub-expression for something else, uh, shifting different variables to different time periods throughout the expression. And also, we want to just extract and get lists of what symbols appear in these equations, at what times, in which equations, in what order, uh, so that we can do some more analysis. The second component of Doling is, is a compiler. And by that, I mean that we're going to take these Julia expressions, or these, these raw bits of mathematical functions, and we're going to create Julia functions from them. Then you actually call, feed in numbers, and get numbers out. Um, the compiler is fairly flexible. You're going to get multiple methods. You have a method that allocates the output, that just mutates some th array that you feed it. You can, you can uh, evaluate derivatives of these mathematical expressions. And one of the cool things that I recently implemented is we're going to get, we're going to produce a, uh, an at sign generated function that does symbolic or analytic differentiation at runtime. Uh, whenever the user asks for a particular order derivative, at that moment, the first time it's asked for, I'll actually do the symbolic differentiation, construct the Julia code that does it, and then run that code. Next time you ask for that same order derivative, I just run the code directly. And I'll show you kind of what I mean by that. And really, what Doling is, is it's not useful that much in and of itself, but we use it as a building block for constructing domain-specific languages for economic modeling. Um, and I'll show two examples of that later. So let's talk about how, you, how I would leverage the first half of Doling, the symbolic manipulation part. So these are just the primitives that I use to build the compiler. So there's one method called normalize. And what this does is it's almost like the gensim function in base. It takes a symbol or an expression and converts it to some like internal representation in, in Dolo. I'm sorry, in Doling. So if I pass a symbol, notice what I get back is I'm just going to put underscores around each side of it. So I know this is kind of my indicator that says this is now that I have underscores on each side. My symbol, I can do what I want with it. It's not something the user gave me. Um, the same holds if I have expressions. If I add two things together, I'm just going to get the output as these same two symbols added together. Um, 
It does, Dulling understands a special notion of timing, because this is going to be important for economic models. I care about past variables today and the future. So I want to build into this symbolic library a notion of timing. And the way I do that is just by kind of a play on the function call syntax. So I have a variable x. I use parentheses to know, denote I'm calling, a f calling the function x. And I pass an integer. This is telling me this is really x at time t plus 1. This is x tomorrow. And then this is going to be lowered in a slightly different way. It's going to produce a slightly different symbol than we saw when we just did x. If we have x of 0, this is the difference between this and just x by itself is in the first case up at the top, I'm thinking x is some parameter. It's static. It's never going to change. It doesn't vary over time. When I have x0, it's saying this is a time varying variable, uh, but it happens to be evaluated at the current period or at, at time t, I would, I would call it. So then this is going to be lowered in this way. And then we can also shift backwards in time. Um, and so now that we understand this notion of timing, we, we want to be able to move it around. So there's this time shift function that takes some symbol or expression, some, something like that, as well as an integer. And it says, for every symbol or expression that appears in this uh, expression, if it's time varying, shift it forward or backwards by a specified number of periods. So in this example, None of these things, because there's no function call syntax, none of these are time varying. So when I try to shift time, nothing happens. I get back what I put in. However, if I start calling x a time varying variable and y a time varying variable, and I try to shift it forward, I guess, zero periods, I again get back what I want, what I put in. But if I shift it one period forward, notice that x has moved from x0 to x1, y has moved from y1 to y2, but we didn't touch z. Because in our mini DSL or our language, z didn't appear to be a time varying variable, so we didn't move it. Um, we can also shift backwards in time. So x0 becomes x minus 1 and so on if I pass a negative number as that second argument. Um, then another one that's a bit more exciting or a bit more fun is that there's this c subs function that does clever substitutions. That's where the c comes from. So here, Notice I've got some dictionary D that says I'm going to map B into C divided by A. And I want to change C, I want to replace that by 2 times A. So then if I have some expression A plus B, and I want to substitute it with the values in this dictionary D, what's going to happen is it's going to see that A doesn't appear as a key in the dictionary. I'm not going to touch that. However, B does. So I'm going to say B should be replaced by C over A. And then it's going to go and recursively resolve this and say C actually happens to be a key in my dictionary. So it should really be replaced by 2A over A uh, instead of just C over A. Um, and it also understands this interacts with the timing system that we've built here, where if I have A plus B0 plus B1, and I'm telling you that B should really be replaced by something different, notice that this was replaced with B0 became C0 plus D1, and then B1 was C1 plus D2. So I've got this notion of being able to substitute sub-expressions with an implicit understanding of the timing assumptions that we've made. There's a few other functions. I think we've seen enough. Uh, this isn't particularly exciting. There's a steady state function that just shifts all time varying variables to be at time 0. Um, you can also list all the symbols which is going to give you a dictionary of stuff that varies in time and stuff that doesn't. Then you can unpack these things separately if you want. And then there's a subs function that just does like one level deep expression matching. It doesn't do this clever recursive thing that we just saw. Um, so that's the first half of Dilling. The second half uh, is, is the compiler. And what this does is it's going to take a vector of expressions that represent a system of equations. It's going to take some variables that might change over time or that we might want to compute derivatives with respect to. And then it's going to take a bunch of or another vector of static parameters that are non-time varying. And it's going to take these three things and it's going to spit out Julia functions that we can use to evaluate our system of equations. Uh, and it's going to spit out a number of methods for this function. Some of them, the most basic one is just going to allocate whatever output array is needed to store the result. Uh, another one, you can pass in a pre-allocated array and we'll mutate that for you. We also have like partially or fully vectorized versions of this method. 
or methods for this function, which is similar to like the broadcasting that's in base. But here, we're going to be broadcasting a matrix with a vector in a, a particular way, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. So we can't just leverage the the dot notation that made it into zero five. Um, so let's see some basic examples. So the compiler is really implemented as a series of methods on a function factory type. And what we're going to do here is we're going to define just a vector of equations. Um, what they are doesn't really matter for the example. But just we're passing in a vector of ex Julia expressions. Uh, and then we're going to have, we can leverage that substitution functionality I talked about. So we're going to define a dictionary that m changes a into some function of I'm sorry, x into some function of a and c. Then we're going to list the arguments. Now the notation here is slightly new, or we haven't seen it yet. What this means is that I'm expecting, or I'm allowing, somewhere in the equations that we have in the top line, the variable a to appear at time minus 1. And so on a at time 0, b at time 0, and so forth. And what happens is we can ask the Dolang library to kind of validate our equations and make sure that there are no unknown or unexpected symbols that show up. Uh, and this is helpful for checking to make sure that the model you're writing down is fully specified. Uh, then this params thing, u we're just going to say is non-time varying. It's a fixed parameter, kind of like the theta Pearl was talking about. Um, and then targets is going to say, instead of like trying to evaluate this as like a nonlinear system that we're trying to solve, which we would want each of these equations to be set equal to zero. We're going to say, let's keep foo and ping on the left-hand side, and we can evaluate directly to those variables. Um, so then we shove all this together inside of our function factory, uh, and then we can kind of have some fun. So here, there's one main core method that users are going to use called make function. So if we feed in our function factory to make function, what it's going to do is produce uh, a bunch of Julia code. It's going to have two main functions. One is like an allocating version of the function, and two is the, uh, the, the mutating or the non-allocating one, and then a series of methods for each of these functions. In order to actually use this, we first get the code, and then we have to evaluate the code. If we didn't want to just evaluate the code in memory, we could alternatively write it out to a file and then include it somewhere inside of a larger project. But the idea is this make function doesn't return something we can call directly. It just returns like the expression containing Julia code that so has to be evaluated before it can be called. So let's see what it generated. It generated five methods for us. Um, and notice we chose to name this thing my fun. So we're seeing five methods for our function. And we're also going to see the equal number of methods for the mutating version of this function. So let's see how we evaluate it. We told it that there would be six arguments. So we need a vector v that contains six elements. Uh, and then the parameter vector just had a single item. So it's just a one element vector. Uh, and then we can go ahead and evaluate our functions. That's great. Um, here we're showing that we can evaluate a vectorized version. So what this, the assumption that's made is if any matrix or higher order, or higher uh, dimensionality array is put in, we're going to assume that the variables appear in the, in the last dimension. So in case of a matrix, we're going to have each variable is one column, and then the rows are all the obs or a single observation of all variables. Uh, and then the output is ordered similarly. So we have, we're just going to repeat this v vector as two columns, but then we've got to transpose it. So we make sure that each column contains just one variable. And then we see that the output is just going to be repeated uh, twice. We can also do the mutating version. Notice here I'm evaluating it once. This is just going to let the JIT do its work and not count that against me in how much memory is allocated. And then we can show that we don't allocate anything, which is nice. And the output's the same as what we saw above. So this is indeed doing what I've advertised. Uh, and something that's more or something extra we get here is we can evaluate derivatives. So what if we want to evaluate the Jacobian matrix for this system of equations? Well, all we do is we pass as the first argument this DER, or derivative shorthand, uh, and then in, print, or in curly braces as a type parameter, we pass the order of derivative we'd like to evaluate. So here we're going to get back to the Jacobian, which is the number of equations, a matrix of the number of equations by the number of uh, variables that appear. 
and these are all just the partial derivatives of each, each row is the partial derivative of one equation with respect to all the variables that we passed. Um, we can compute second derivatives and notice here that I called it twice for you and showed the timing. The timing for the first time is much higher. Why? There's two things that happen. One is actually when I first called this, it actually went and it differentiated, it did a symbolic differenti differentiation of these original functions. I passed it, produced code that could evaluate those derivatives, and then let Julia's JIT compile it for us. So that happened on the first time I called that with asking for the second derivative. But then when I ask for it again, the code's already been compiled, already been uh, differentiated, so it can just rerun the compile version. Um, I had, yeah, that's fine. We can do this for any order derivative. So if for some reason you really wanted the 10th ordered set of full mixed partial derivatives, you could ask it for that and it would do it for you. It takes not that much longer actually to compute the derivatives of this very simple system for 10th order as it did for second, but uh, it still evaluates very quickly. And what we get back here is a, a dictionary that maps a 10 element tuple into a value where each element of the tuple says what order derivative do I want with respect to each variable. Um, and then these are gonna be non-decreasing because the derivative here should be, sorry, um, what we're doing here is this is going to say we're doing this for the first variable, we're going to do the second derivative, the second variable, do the second derivative, and so on. Um, and because part mixed partial derivatives are usually symmetric for most standard functions, we're not going to compute all possible permutations of these keys. We're just going to give you one of them, and then you as the user can recognize that these are going to be symmetric and deal with it appropriately. Um, so here's another example. We can also specify an extra argument to this function factory that can be used to drive dispatch. So here we have a new system of equations, new set of arguments and parameters. And the only difference for when we constructed our function factory is I passed in here the type int. I didn't pass, it, I didn't pass an int, I just passed the type int. And what this does is it's going to create a, a new set of methods for the same function name that are going to be, we can only call them if we pass an instance of int when we're trying to call it. Let me show you what this means. So here's my new variable vector and parameter vector. In order to call these new methods, I need to pass some instance of int as the first argument, and that's going to tell dispatch, I really want this second set of methods for my fun instead of the first one. So when we evaluate this, uh, it works. The actual instance of int that I passed doesn't matter. We could do 42, compare it to just some random integer. We're going to get the same thing. The key is that the instance we pass is just used to drive dispatch. And why this matters is you can imagine, like Pearl was talking about a transition equation or a measurement equation. If you had multiple models, you couldn't just name something measurement. You'd need the model itself as one of the arguments to drive dispatch to do the correct transition or correct measurement equation. Uh, and that's what this allows. If I didn't have this ability to um, pick different implementations of a function with the same name based on a particular argument, then I really couldn't pick the right measurement or right transition equation. Um, finally, the last like main way you can use this is I can actually construct of functions that have not just one vector of time varying parameters but maybe multiple. So here what we've done is if you notice in the previous set of methods they were always something like I have an array v and an array p. v was my time varying things, p were my static parameters. Uh, now what I'm doing here is I've got an array a, an array b, and then another array p. So I've split the time varying things into two groups, A and B. Why might this matter? So if I'm writing a model down, I might group some variables as states. I might group others as control variables. And it's helpful for me to think about how to model these things if I can group my variables according to how they impact the model or how they enter the model. So that's what we can do here. And then 
just now that we have this grouped arguments, we have to pass it these two vectors that we promised were going to be inputs, as well as our parameter. And we can do similar things. This is going to show off a bit how I, what I mean by partially vectorizing. So here, this first argument, I've said I want to do a and a plus 1. And I'm going to stack these things as rows so that the variable's running down columns. And then I'm just going to pass that vector v. And it's going to do this like implicit broadcasting to make sure that b is copied for each row of a that appears. Um, we could do derivatives also. Notice again, these derivatives are computed symbolically at runtime, uh, the first time you ask for them. And then the next time it runs very quickly because it's not computing derivatives, you're compiling functions. Um, at this point, because cross partials get a little, little uh, tricky with multiple vector arguments, uh, I'm just doing first order derivatives for now. We could do higher order, but not yet. I, I haven't needed them yet, so maybe when I need them, I'll do it. Uh, so I want to give one like implementation detail. Here's a question I want to pose. If someone knows the answer, I'll give you 15 seconds to think and respond. So my question is, how can we do symbolic derivatives at runtime when the user asks for it? Really what I mean by that is, where do we store this symbolic data so it's available when the derivatives need to be computed? Uh, we know that this function factory has all the data and knows how to compute derivatives, but by the time the user is actually calling the function we've created for them, who knows where that function factory is, what happened to it, uh, what, what can we do? Where do we store this data so it's persistent and we can use it to generate these derivatives at runtime? I'm going to pause. Any ideas? So this is pretty simple, actually. We just embed the instance of function factory in the body of our generated function. So here we go. I'm going to make a simple, just a simple function factory. And then I'm going to show you the first method that's generated when I call make function. Here, notice it's an at sign generated function. And there are two lines in this function. First, we're going to grab this embedded instance of our function factory. And then second, we're going to hand that off to a doling function that knows how to compute the d order derivative of that function factory. And what this thing does is it returns the function body is going to return a Julia expression that evaluates the body of the function for that order derivative. Uh, and we're good to go. Uh, I didn't think this would work. I didn't think I could like embed objects in these generated functions, but I guess I can. So that's kind of cool. Um, OK, so what's dolo.jl? So this is a library for working with rational expectations models. Uh, there are two main components. One is we have a language for describing models via their key equations, and then their groups of variables or parameters. Uh, and then the second main component is we have a reference implementation of various global nonlinear solution algorithms. Uh, and if you're familiar with economics, some algorithms in this list may jump out at you. Uh, if not, I'll spare you the, the pain of me reading them. So, so far, like I said, we have a reference implementation. We haven't focused on performance yet. But we plan to have these algorithms be more efficient than most people's like handwritten code. Um, and actually, we're already doing pretty well. If you just do a naive implementation of some of these algorithms, chances are it's going to be slower than what we have right now. Uh, but we can still do better. There's lots of things we can do to enhance performance. We haven't tried at all. Um, We've just been getting functionality down and in place. Uh, another thing, it leverages Doling as this compiler. So let's look at some examples. Or actually, let's talk about for one minute why it's unique or different from other modeling software. First, it's 100% Julia with very permissive license. This actually matters quite a bit because it makes it easier to use in industry or in government settings. If I'm at a central bank, it's not that hard to convince the IT team to let me use some free software relative to purchasing expensive licenses or dealing with GPL or licensing issues. Um, second, is model usually written in a mathematical notation that maps very closely into what you'd write on the, the whiteboard as you're trying to first write down a model or what you see when you read a paper. Second, what this does is it allows you to separate the definition or description of the model from the actual code that's used to solve it or the algorithms. Um, yeah, another key feature is that it automates the defining of Julia functions for evaluating model functions. I know I've seen when I did a little bit of work with the New York Fed team, 
a large chunk of like getting off the ground was let's write down all these huge systems of equations and build these state space matrices. Uh, that's kind of laborious work if you're going to be changing the model quite a bit, and this can be automated. Um, and then finally, it implements global nonlinear solution algorithms that handle occasionally binding constraints. And I'll see a couple examples of why those two features matter. Uh, that's where we'll go to next. So first, I'm going to think about a sudden stop model. Again, I told you, I, I promised I wouldn't talk too much economics, but I guess I lied a little bit. Uh, so what this is, is this a model of what might happen if some country or agent was suddenly cut off from further access to financial markets? It could be that there might be some constraint that says, I can only borrow up to a certain amount of my asset holdings, and then the lender's not going to let me borrow anymore. What happens at that point when the user reaches this constraint, or when the agent reaches that constraint, what happens to their choices? That's kind of the, the flavor of model I have in mind. So really, I'm going to show you how the model's actually defined, and it looks like it didn't show up very well on this page, so I'm going to drop out of the slides real quick. Um, so this is, I'm reading in a string that's just containing some YAML file, and then I'm printing that to the screen. So this is just a file that sits on my computer somewhere. And what I can do, I can denote symbols, and I'm going to group these things into what type of variable they are for my model. They could be states, they could be controls, parameters, or they could be some exogenous stochastic process. I've got some definitions. These are repeated expressions that aren't necessarily control variables or state variables, but they're useful to define. For example, Y has a natural or interpretation of being output in this model, where C is consumption. And I can compute consumption based on other variables that I have in the model. So I don't really want to define them or classify them as states or controls, but I might want to use them later on in my equations. Then I can define different types of equations. I've got this transition equation that maps states yesterday into states today. Or, or sorry, yes, states yesterday, controls yesterday, and then maybe exogenous shocks. And then I've also got these arbitrage equations. These are like first order conditions. These are the optimality conditions that uh, I'm going to be using to find the optimal control functions. I've got another section that defines the initial calibrated values for parameters. And notice they can be straight numbers or they can reference one another and then we'll recursively resolve this system and get it down to just numbers. I can tell you what type of exogenous shocks I want. They could be Markov chains, they could be autoregressive, they could just be IID. Uh, I can specify like the domain on my state variables that I want to consider and then what type of grid I might want to build. So this is what I meant, though, by this maps fairly closely into what I'd see on the whiteboard. Uh, I might write down, one second, this is going to load. I might write down this equation on the whiteboard. Uh, and it's very similar to what I have up here. Uh, so this is helpful in minimizing like, the, the effort I take to go from thinking about a model to actually having one I can use and play with in, in code form. OK, so then let's think about solving it. So here, I can do a linear solution for this model. This is similar to taking a DSGE model and making it a linear state space model, kind of what Pearl was talking about before. Uh, they're, they're doing it on a much bigger and more complicated scale. Or I could also use another algorithm we've implemented in Dolo that does a global nonlinear solution to the model. And we're going to take a little, we take a look at uh, what the difference looks like of the actual solution we've computed. The first time it was compiling a bunch of stuff. When I run this the second time, it runs super fast. Um, so this is just a helper function that helps me plot things. I'm not going to walk through that right now. Um, and then let's look at a plot. So what we have here is I'm going to plot the on the x-axis, I've got current or current period capital stock. And then the lines I'm plotting are the price of capital as a, computed in equilibrium as a function of the, the amount of assets I'd like to have for tomorrow. And notice when I wrote the model down, this lambda is kind of representing the price. I put a, a, I put a constraint. I said lambda can't go below this lambda inf variable. Uh, and I've set that equal to minus 0.2. So when I compute this global nonlinear solution, 
I, I see, that's the orange line, the top one. Lambda never goes below 0 point, minus 0 0.2. This constraint is respected. However, if I had just used some linear solution around a particular point, so do a Taylor series expansion around this point 0, 0, it's obviously not going to be able to take into account the constraint. And here, I, I miss a feature of the model. Um, as a second example, this is kind of going to highlight so this highlighted why constraints are important. Now I'm going to highlight why thinking about nonlinear nonlinearities in policy rules matters. Um, so here I'll load up another method. So how much time do I have? Okay, yeah. I'll finish up soon. So here we go. Now I want to solve this. So I've loaded up a second model, and you can see kind of a, a printout of it right here. So here I've defined a whole bunch more. Before I had just two types of equations. Here I've defined a bunch more types of equations. What this is going to do, if I have access to, say, a value function, I can use the value function iteration algorithm. So there's certain algorithms I'll be able to leverage if I've told Dolo information about that, the relevant equations for those algorithms. Uh, but here, we're just going to use the same two we did before. And we're actually going to call the same methods. And we're going to pass it a new instance of model. And it's going to compute these solutions, both a linearized version and a nonlinear one. And not only is it the same algorithm, but it's actually the exact same implementation of the algorithm. So here I have two completely different models, yet they share some features. And the uh, restrictions I've put on the modeling language that I say certain variables need to be classified and then equations can only have certain variables appear allows me to be a bit more abstract in thinking about the solution algorithm. As long as m models provide me with certain information and respect certain constraints, I can then use a generic implementation of these solution algorithms. Um, so I've done that. Now we're going to visualize kind of the nonlinearities. So here, this model, one of the, the key variables that we think about is choosing how much I want to work. Sorry, one sec. For some reason my slides are getting all funky, but. Okay, so here what we're going to do is this point right here, this is where I chose to compute the linear solution around. Uh, and so the, the two solutions line up exactly, but as I move away from this point, the linear solution, this blue line, stays as a straight line, but then the nonlinear one moves around. And so we're here in like these regions where capital stock is low. We're missing, by trying to compute a linear solution, we're missing some relevant economic uh, behavior for these agents. People, when they don't have very much capital, they need to work more so that they can consume. And we're missing that when we just have a linearized solution. Uh, we can look at something similar for how much do I invest. In this particular set of parameters, it doesn't look very different. But let's do an experiment. Suppose that I want to change how much I don't like to work. This is governed by a parameter eta, and I want to move that from 1 to 2. So I'm effectively doubling how much I hate working. So when I do that, I change the parameter values, and this will go and it will uh, be resolved throughout the model. I can compute the solutions again and construct similar plots. The labor one looks very similar. Uh, however, the, the investment one, notice that now that I really hate working more, I start to see that the linear version of my model isn't capturing everything like I used to. Um, so this is why we feel it's important that Dolo provides these nonlinear solution algorithms to a generic description of a model so that you can capture things like this. Um, just to finish, some, some attributions or some things. So I want to thank Pablo, Pablo Wynant. He started the first version of Dolo when he was working on his thesis and when he was at the Bank of England and the IMF. Dolo.jl was started by me, Pablo, Anastasia, and James Graham last summer when we were working at the Bank of England. Uh, Dolang is written by me and Pablo. We've got financial support from Quant Econ in addition to these other institutions. And then thanks to the Julia Kahn Committee and Berkeley for accepting the talk and hosting the, the conference. So that's it. I think I have one or two minutes for questions if anyone has any. Yeah. Uh, the uh, 
Uh, yeah, so what you saw there, here, I don't want that. This too. What you saw there was we've implemented like a, a show method for the text HTML MIME type. And we know how to convert our expressions into LaTeX, so we're just using that when we're in the notebook to dump the LaTeX and let MathJax render it. Sorry, what's that? So we need to speak into both. So this is for the recording okay. and this is for the auditor. Yeah, so we could easily construct the same system of equations just like in Julia code in memory, and it would work in a similar way. Uh, what's kind of nice is we also have a Python version of this library. So if we write it in this plain text file, this YAML file, we can use it in both the Python and Julia versions of our library. So that's the main reason. We're trying to separate as much as possible the model from actually writing code that solves and deals with the model. Uh, I might just uh, follow up this later, so keep yeah. it on schedule, um, but please schedule your round up. Uh, just a quick thank you.